Good morning, Calvary Chapel. It's always so great to be with you in God's Word on a Sunday morning. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 17 as we continue our journey through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And let's take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless our time together. Our Heavenly Father, You are the great God above it all. We worship You this morning, God, for who You are for what you've done, for your heart for people. We worship you and praise you for your faithfulness and your goodness. Father, your love, your mercy, your grace towards people. We thank you, Lord, because you are above it all. I also want to praise you, Lord, this morning for the power of the Spirit and the power of your Word to save us, to change our lives, to transform a person from darkness into light. I thank you, Lord, because only you have that power. I thank you that we can know you in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the way of salvation that you open up for us. I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much. And I want to pray as we look into your word now, may you bless this time together as your church, as your children, in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 17. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down and have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, therefore we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor does he worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times, their boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, 
for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius and the Areopagite, a woman named Demaris, and others with them. You know, the last thing that our Lord Jesus Christ said before he ascended into heaven was Matthew 28, verse 18. And he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, Jesus gave us the Great Commission. And so as many of us who love the Lord, who are saved by the blood of Jesus, know it's not always an easy thing to evangelize, to share the gospel, to witness with people. Because it just seems to us that the majority of people are not open to receive the word of God. It's like if I told you that I had a bottle of ice cold water here, all you have to do is come and get it. You know, even to something basic like that, there will be different kind of responses. There will be different reactions. Someone will say, well, you know what? I don't drink water. Water is for washing your hands. It's not for drinking. I, I drink Coke. I drink tea. Some herbal tea, maybe. Someone else will say, well, you know what? I like water, but only special kind of water. Only natural water from a certain brook, from a certain spring, whatever it may be. But let me tell you, the one person who is thirsty... He's going to say, yes, please give me that water. Give it to me now because I need it. Very similar way, not everyone respond to the gospel in the same way when we present it to them. You know, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells this beautiful parable of the sower, where the sower went out to sow. And of course, the seed that he was sowing was representing the word of God. And so he says he goes out to sow and some of the seed fell by the wayside. With trample. Other seed fell on the stony ground, you know, where there's only a little bit of depth of earth, no place to put down roots. Other seed falls down between the thorns, where it's choked by the cares and the things of this world. And then he says, lastly, but some of the seed fell on the good ground, you know, it's not all the same. But we don't share the gospel. Because it's easy. We don't share the gospel because it's something that people love to hear or something that they like when they hear it. We do it because we were commissioned by our Lord and Savior to go and to all the world. You know, Jesus said so clearly in Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, we as Christians are called to shine. We're called to preserve. We're called to flavor the things of this world. And the only way that we can truly do it is by walking in the Spirit, by being in the Word, by sharing the gospel with people so they can be saved. And I guess a lot of people will say, many Christians, maybe new Christians say, well, I'm just not sure how to do it. They, feel, they don't feel confident. They feel like unsure of how to go about sharing the gospel. Well, that's why we have the Word of God. That's why we see Paul here being such a great example of evangelizing really by the Spirit of God. You know, when we see Paul, he says in Romans 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew and for the Greek. Paul believed in the power of the gospel, and that's the first thing that we really want to take note of. 
So in the story, now Paul and Silas are still on their second missionary journey. The last time we saw them was in Philippi with Timothy and Luke, and we saw two households being saved, both the household of Lydia and the household of the jailer who kept them. And in this process, they were brutally beaten, they were thrown into prison, and then eventually they were asked to leave. They were pretty much kicked out of the city, and this was all for the sake of the gospel, for righteousness' sake. And now we see in this chapter that Paul takes the gospel right into the heart of the Greek world. You know, of course, the Romans ruled the world at this stage. It was a Roman rule of the Roman Empire, but Greek thought prevailed, especially in the places where Paul was now going into. Interesting, this guy who grew up as a Pharisaical Jew, he grew up understanding the Torah, the Word of God, but he also was a Roman citizen, a blessing that God allowed in his life to open up some doors for him, and also he grew up a part of his life in Tarsus, where he got to know and understand the Greek mindset. But the thing is, he had a biblical worldview, and now he's making his way into the heart of the Greek culture and thinking and we can learn so much from how God used him. So if you're taking note, evangelizing by the Spirit. Because as you witness to the people in the world, you will get a number of responses. You will find some of those people, number one, if you're taking note, resisting the word of God. Look there again with me at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So they were making their way down now and they came to Thessalonica. It was mainly a Greek city about 160 kilometers uh, from Philippi, the capital of Macedonia. It was an important city. It was very strategically located on the right trade routes and also it had a good harbor. They probably left Luke and Philippi to care for the new believers there because you know the narrative now changes to the third person again where it says they, no longer we. Look at two. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. That's what Paul always did. You know, he preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but to the Jews first. He always did it. And it says for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He dialogued, he discussed, he reasoned. You know, he could reason with them because we have a reasonable faith. Everything that we believe makes sense if you are open to truth, if you are willing to sit down and listen. But it says Paul reasoned with them not from his intellect, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. They already, as Jews, believed the word of God at that stage. They didn't have the full scripture we have. But now he used their own scriptures to show them the truth. And I think this is number one of the secondary things we want to look at this morning. When you're evangelizing, use the scriptures. Because it is the Word of God. It is something that God has planned and laid out by His Holy Spirit. Don't reason from your intellect or from some kind of knowledge that you may have. Why? Because Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So especially, I want to tell you, when you're witnessing to religious people, maybe the cults or whoever, people who've got some kind of idea of the Scriptures, just trust the sufficiency of the Word of God and share the Word of God with them. You know, the fact is the Word of God is all the answers that we need for life and godliness. Plus, it presents to us the only true way of salvation. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You know, the Word of God can do what no mere logic can do. It can cut through the hardest, coldest, distant heart. This is not just another book. This book was breathed by God, inspired by God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. And no, it hasn't changed over the centuries. Because the moment that you start witnessing and telling someone, listen, this is what the Word of God says, they're going to say, how can you go to the Bible? You know, there's been so many years, so many writers, you know, the stories have changed. And, you say, and then you say, well, how do you know that? Can you give me an example of that? Because that's normally 
like not third hand, but it's like fourth, fifth, sixth hand knowledge that they're giving. They heard it from someone and it sounded like a good reason not to believe in the word of God. Let me tell you, the word we have today is still the same word. If you truly, in all sincerity and truth, look at the manuscript evidence, at the internal consistency, at the fulfilled prophecy and many, many other things of the word of God, there is no way that you will come to any other conclusion. This is the most reliable, most solid, most truthful book that's ever been written. This Bible that I hold in my hand is literally translated from the ancient manuscript copies. You know, it surpasses any other ancient document in every way. Today we have more than 25,000 partial and complete manuscript copies of the New Testament. Many of them dating back to the first century, only a short time after Jesus himself was there. And the Bible is absolutely unrivaled among any other ancient manuscript. You know, there's no second place even. The second place, if you could call it that, is Homer's Iliad with 642 copies. You know, compared to 25,000 just in the New Testament. And then, the, the closest copy they have of Homer's Iliad is 400 years time span since he's written it. You know, so if you look at the Bible in its accuracy... And of course, in its transformation power, there is simply no other book who can ever compare in the slightest bit to the Word of God. Look at verse 3. He was explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So here Paul was giving an exegesis on Jesus. He was opening up the scriptures, drawing out of the scriptures, explaining what the scriptures meant, laying it out for them, and of course doing it all by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, some people have legitimate questions about the faith, about what the Word of God says, and we need to always be ready to give an answer to those who ask us for a reason, as Second Peter 3 verse 15 tells us. And he says to them how the Christ had to suffer and rose from the dead. He showed them things that they never saw before. He showed them the necessity as well as the evidence of the Messiah suffering and dying. You know, passages like Isaiah 53, like Psalm 22. I don't know what all he used, but he pointed them to the scriptures. And this is the second underlying thing. If we want to take note of how to evangelize, we need to give the full gospel. People need to understand the gospel, the whole gospel, to be saved. And the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for our sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. According to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 to 5, as Paul lays it out so clearly. You see, Paul always preached the resurrection because without the resurrection, there can be no Christianity. And he says, this Jesus whom I preach is the Christ. So the one that I'm telling you, this is the one I'm telling you to put your faith in. It's all fulfilled in him. And this is the third underlying thing that I want to share with you when you are evangelizing. Is we need to point people to Jesus. Jesus is the only answer. He's the only Savior. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the answer. And the focus should always be on Him. Look at verse 4. And some of them were persuaded. And a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So never be put off. When everyone doesn't immediately fully see the truth, you know, or understand the truth. Here we see some people were persuaded, but it's actually a great multitude of all these people, the devout Greeks, leading women, you know. And so after three weeks of ministry here, many people believe, especially the Greek proselytes and the influential women. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So the Jews who didn't believe, they became envious of the success of Paul right here. They became very upset when all these proselytes and the influential women started leaving the synagogue and going after Paul. It's the same kind of thing we saw in Antioch in Acts 13, in Iconium, Lystra, you know, in Acts chapter 14. Because Satan hates the gospel. He knows it's the only way to salvation and he will oppose it in any way that he can. So let me tell you, don't be shocked when you are evangelizing. 
when you're witnessing, when you're attacked, either spiritually or even physically, when you share the gospel, we need to be ready for that. And so we see here that Paul gave them the truth, he gave them the gospel, and he gave them the focus on Jesus Christ as the Savior. And they resisted and they rejected the word of God. And this is a reminder to us that our job as Christians is to evangelize, to witness, not to change people's hearts. Only God can do the work in a person's heart. Only God can bring them to salvation. So a successful witnessing opportunity is not just when someone accepts the Lord as their Savior, but when we've witnessed successfully, when we shared the gospel with them, when we shared the truth of the word with them, when we shared Jesus Christ with them. And look there, now they gathered a mob and they set the city in an uproar. They attacked the house of Jason. This very violent persecution starts now. Verse 6, but they did not find them. They dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. So they couldn't find Paul and Silas and Jason was the Christian of Thessalonica in whose house they, they met together. So now they thought, well, let's take Jason and his buddies, you know. He says, these who have turned the world upside down. That's what you call effective evangelism. Because in actual fact, they turned the world the right side up. The world is upside down. Haven't you noticed? It's interesting why people get so angry. Why do people get so angry when you share the truth with them in love? You know why? Because they prefer their sin. They want their sin. They want the lies and they get angry. They don't want to be confronted with the truth. We live in a world today where not only do they not want to hear the truth, they want you to agree with them that their lie that they are living, their wickedness, their evil is right. They want that agreement from us. Look at verse 7. Jason has harbored them and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there is another king, Jesus. So they were saying they're disturbing the peace, they're promoting treason. You know, that whole phrase, there's another King Jesus, was a volatile thing they said. It's a serious accusation of treason against Rome. But these guys were Jews. You know, they didn't really support Rome. So it's very interesting what reasoning they would come up with. Verse 8, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So everyone was disturbed when they heard this. Because that's the power of someone's word. It's not based on facts. Is just based on hearsay, based on the emotion of the crowd. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. You see, the Roman officials didn't care about what the people believed, not at all, as long as there was no riots. You know? And so Jason had to give them money, had to give them a guarantee that Paul and Silas would leave the city and not come back again, and then they let them go. It says in verse 10, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. So Paul and Silas left under the cover of darkness, under the cover of night. And they went to Berea, which is like 73 kilometers westward. Or you could say like west-southwest if you want to be technical. And guess what? The first thing they did is they went to the synagogue. As soon as they arrived, they did what they always did. You know, they went with the gospel to the Jews first. You know, they didn't take some kind of break saying, oh, we had a rough time now. Let's just take a moment because evangelism was their lifestyle. That's what they did. It's not a one-time outreach event. So if you're taking note, the second group of people we want to look at now is number two, receiving the word of God. These are the ones in Berea now. Look at verse 11. These were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. It says they were more fair-minded. The Greek word means noble. They were open-minded enough to receive the truth from God's word. And they received it with readiness, which is amazing. You see, the word and the truth was important to them, and they were eager. It says they searched the scriptures daily. That's really what you want people to do. They heard what Paul and Silas said, but said, okay, just wait a moment. We want to just check you against the word of God, because this is what it says here. This is what it says there. That's exactly what any person should do. That's why they call them Bereans. You should be a Berean. Don't listen to what any person tells you. Take what they say and measure it against the word and search out the scriptures for yourself to see whether these things were true. You know, they did it daily. 
First Thessalonians 5, 21, Paul says, Test all things, hold fast to what is good. So they're saying to Paul, I wonder if this man is telling the truth. Let's just check it against the word of God. Because the word of God is truth. And it's best to let it speak for itself. To those who really search for the truth, they will find the truth. As God promises in Jeremiah 29 verse 13. So let me tell you, when you evangelize, you never want to contradict the word of God. Don't want to speak against it. And also, you don't want to answer a question if you don't really have the answer to that question. Then you need to go back to the Word of God and search it out. Just tell them, listen, I'll get back to you on that one. And I think modern evangelism actually fails in so many ways. Whether it's like lifestyle evangelism where people think like, well, if necessary, I'll use words. Really? The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if you don't use words, how are people going to get saved? You know, oh, they're just going to look at my life and believe in Jesus. <laughs> I don't think so. Then there's things like friendship evangelism, where people believe I first have to be friend this, I first have to be a friend with a person before I can share Jesus with them. What happens if they die the next day? Same with relational evangelism. Like I feel I need to go out to the bars with them and drink with them, and so you know that kind of thing, so I can relate to them before I can share Jesus. What if you don't get another chance to share Jesus with them? And then, of course, there's the extreme on the other side, the kingdom evangelism, where it's like a force, a dominionism we think, with a spiritual map, and we're going to take this area for God, whatever. How did the early Christians share the gospel? Did they use any of these approaches? No. You know what Acts tells us? Acts 8 verse 4 tells us, Therefore, those who are scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Again, because it's by the word that they're going to get saved. And so these guys were checking, it says, whether these things were so. They checked Paul. They didn't say like, oh, he's such a good speaker. Oh, he's so funny. They said, no, is he speaking the truth? We want to check out if he's speaking the truth. And I think that's one of the biggest problems today is people don't know the truth. They don't know what the word of God says. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, we read, In the last days, perilous times will come. Because people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. A few verses down, verse 4, it says, They will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then still a bit more down, verse 7, it says, Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That sounds exactly like the world we are living in. Today, people are running after every conceivable thing except after the truth except after the word of God and the world is completely lost you know John 8 verse 31 and 32 Jesus says abide in my word and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free look down there at verse 12 therefore many of them believed and also not a few of the Greek prominent women as well as men this will always be the result if you're really searching for the truth I believe that you will find it and the truth is always Jesus the Word of God is the most effective witnessing tool because the words were chosen by God Himself. They are empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is the power to break open any heart, any life. It's like the seed, the Word of God, that fell on good soil as we saw in Matthew chapter 13. Yielding a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And then it says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Also, we see... Some of the Greeks, again, prominent women as well as men were saved. Look at verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. So news travels fast. And the haters in Thessalonica now heard that these guys were down in Berea. And because the word of God is preached, you know, Satan will try to persecute, he will try to bring confusion, he will stir up people, whatever is necessary to hinder the word of God. Verse 14, Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So they feared for Paul's life, they got him out to sea, which has been like, probably like 50 kilometers all the way to the sea. Obviously he got on a boat, we don't have the details of that, but Silas and Timothy remained. So Timothy and Silas, they were non-Jews. They weren't threatened in this area. And so they were, they, they were left by Paul to stay and to take care of these new believers. And I think that's a very important part of evangelism that we miss. 
One of the underlying things, number four in that, if you want to take note, evangelism is about making disciples. It's not about making converts. Because there's a need, after you are saved, to be plugged into the Word of God, to be plugged into fellowship with other believers, to learn and to grow and to continue on in the Word of God, not just to hear the Word and believe for a moment. Look at verse 15. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed they departed. So this is a long journey now down all the way to Athens. I don't know how long it took him. It's more than 500 kilometers. But it says that he sent for Silas and Timothy to come. So he wanted them with him. If you're taking note, number three, disregarding God's word. This is the last group of people that we're going to look at. I think that is most application to the people we meet today. Look at verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. You see, Paul was waiting for them to come. He didn't want to minister without them. He, he wanted them to do the ministry with him. And now he found himself in one of the world's oldest cities. It's really the center of Greek thinking and learning and philosophy. Amazing. It's been referred to as the cradle of Western civilization. I mean, we're talking about the city of Hippocrates, Socrates, you know, Plato, Aristotle, you know, all those great thinkers. But again, Paul wasn't a sightseer. He was a soul winner. He was there to bring the gospel to the people. And as he looked around, it says his spirit was provoked in him when he saw the city was given over to idols. You know, some people said there were more idols than people in the city of Athens. A very religious, but a very lost place. Not unlike Somerset West where we live. And this idolatry made Paul so angry. Because, you know, to evangelize effectively, number five, if you're taking note, we need a burden for the lost. If you don't have a burden for the lost, how are you going to bring the gospel to them? If you don't have a burden, pray. Ask the Lord to put that burden in your heart because that's His desire for you. You know what? If your neighbor's house caught fire at night and the flames are going and they're in bed sleeping and you see it, you're going to go to their door and hammer on their door and knock and say, you've got to open. You're not going to leave them alone until you get them safely out of the house. Why? Because you care for them. So think about how much more should we care for their eternal salvation, their eternal destiny. Their houses are burning. They're on their way to hell for eternity. And we are just walking by them. It's not what God wants for us. Paul's heart was breaking when he saw the city swamped in idolatry, and he was compelled to share. It says in verse 17, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So it's like wherever he could find the opportunity. I think about my life. What about your life? How often do we use the opportunities that God gives us to share? It says daily he was doing this. He was preaching on the street. I'm not saying you should all go and preach on the street. But he was just starting conversations and sharing and reasoning with the people, whoever he could find about God, sharing the gospel with them, not condemning them. He wasn't one of those people standing there with a placard saying, you know, you are going to hell. That's not the kind of guy that he was. He was sharing the truth with them out of sincerity and care in his heart. He didn't want them to be lost, just like God doesn't want anyone to be lost. Verse 18, Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? So now Paul meets two of the big branches of Greek philosophy that developed over many years in that area. The first one is the Epicureans. This was basically hedonism. Epicurus, he viewed the universe as something that's existing and being ruled by chance. It just happened by mere chance. It's just things just came together and this is how it happened. No interference from gods. It's interesting he didn't believe in gods. He just believed they were not interested in the affairs of men. So no eternal soul, no afterlife, no accountability, and of course, no judgment to come. You see, he was atomic materialist. He actually believed in atoms, although he didn't lay out the atomic theory at that stage. He was a very clever guy who believed the whole world was made up of these little building blocks. And he believed that the goal of life is pleasure and serenity and peace. 
So not just running after the, every pleasure of the flesh, but keeping things in moderation. But still, it's basically saying, let's eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Does that sound familiar? You know, that's a huge percentage of the world population that think and believe things like this today. The people that we have to witness to. People today believe in evolution. They believe everything just came by random chance. You know, it just happened to be. Me and the banana, you know. And we're all here by chance and there's no purpose to life. There's no greater plan out there. And then on the other side, you had the Stoic philosophers. That was very different. That came from Zeno. He was a philosopher in 3 BC. And he saw virtue, not pleasure, as the chief purpose of man. He believed that matter is the only reality. And that health and wealth and pleasure, all those things, is neither good nor bad. It's just external things. And we need to sort of control these things and limit these things. I think it was similar in many ways to pantheism. It's like the identification of the universe with God. And also maybe even Buddhism where it's all about the self-control. You have to learn to control yourself. You know, this aesthetic lifestyle. And so there's no personal God because what you can call God is really in all of us. It's like just identification with God because when you die, it's just a return to nature. You just go back to being part of this thing that you've always been part of. You know what? And that sounds exactly like another huge portion of the world population today. That's exactly what people believe. Isn't it interesting? And that's why Paul was troubled and burdened because you know what? God made you. He loves you. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And all these things speak exactly against that. That's why kids kill themselves today. Because they feel, I'm just a random chance thing. There's no purpose in my life. Let me tell you, God loves you so much that He sent His only Son to die for your sin on the cross and to rise again on the third day. You know, John 3.16 tells us about that. That's the one verse that just about every person knows. You should know the truth. So here Paul is bringing God's truth, trying to shine the light of the gospel into the darkness. And they say, he's a babbler. What does this babbler have to say? Really meaning he's speaking nonsense. He's using empty words. You know, they look down on him as what is this unskilled do trying to do right here in our area of expertise and philosophy speaking words that doesn't make any sense and then someone said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods and <laughs> talk about misunderstanding paul you know they saw he's teaching jesus and the resurrection so they saw it as two different gods and like multiple gods so isn't it interesting that after all these centuries of culture and wisdom the greeks didn't even know the one true God, the one who saves. Isn't that so sad? And so it says there that he preached Jesus and the resurrection. That's the essence of Paul's message right here. He didn't change his message to fit the different circumstance or the different environment. He always preached the same thing. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1 and 2. Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or with wisdom, Declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When we preach, we don't preach philosophy or ideas or ideologies. We preach Jesus. And I think that's the sixth thing you can take down. Is to evangelize, we preach Jesus. Don't preach anything else. No matter how simple it may seem among so-called intelligent, learned people of the world. You know, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, Paul says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. That's the difference. It depends on what kind of soil that word falls into. So understand, that's exactly the same today. Don't try to hype up the gospel. Put glitter on it. Just preach Jesus. You know, I love what C.S. Lewis said. He said, the gospel is like a lion in a cage. You don't have to defend it. Just open the cage and let it out. It's like, don't try to do anything with the gospel. Just take the gospel and share it as it is, because that is the power of God to save people. So these people were so cultured, they thought they understood life. 
The Epicureans thought life is something to enjoy. The Stoics thought life is something to endure. But now Paul comes on the scene. He wanted to show them the source of life. True everlasting life. Jesus Christ who said himself in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Look at verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. So the Areopagus is that hill of Ares. It's called Mars Hill in the Roman language. You know, it was basically just this big rock northwest of the Acropolis, just outside there. And they saying to him, what new doctrine? So they put him up there. It's like almost like speaker's corner. And they say, what new doctrine do you have? You see, these guys were all about novelty. So they were ready to hear him out for the moment at least. Verse 20, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. So explain the things that you are telling us that we may judge according to our wisdom and our philosophies and that kind of thing. And understand this, when you witness, many people will find the gospel strange without the context of sin and judgment and death. People don't understand. People who are in the world today, these things have passed from their knowledge. It's been many, many years since people used to hear the word of God regularly. And it's like when you tell someone, listen, I've got a cure for you. They're going to say, oh, thanks, buddy, but I don't need a cure. I'm not sick. There's no problem with me. People today in the world need to understand who God is. They need to understand that we were created by him, that we are sinners because we rebelled against him. That we are born in sin and therefore we are destined to die. That's the wages of sin is death. And so for that reason, we need a savior. If you tell people, if you show them the sickness, then they say, okay, please give me the cure. If they understand it. Look at verse 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They're not committed to anything. They just wanted to hear something new. They were like info addicts, you know, very similar to the people just sitting on their phones. They're just watching thing after thing. After. They're just amassing all these things, but not really learning anything. And watch out, because sometimes when you witness, there are some people who just love to argue. They're not sincere. They don't really want to know the truth. And oftentimes that's someone else just standing by as you are talking to someone and someone else is asking all these questions. Don't waste your time. You, have to need, you need discernment. We need to focus when we are evangelizing. Verse 22, then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. You see, Paul now, very cleverly, is meeting them right where they are at. Surrounded by all these idols. Surrounded by religion. Surrounded by philosophy. You know, as we think about Jesus, it's the same way Jesus oftentimes met people exactly where they are. Think about the woman at the well. She was there for water and he started speaking to her about living water. And so this is number seven. If you're taking note, when you're evangelizing, try and understand where the people are. Pray for the sermon, how you can reach them. We need the sermon. We need to ask God. God, show me what I can say to meet them in the place that they are at. Verse 23. Paul says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. So Paul relates to them so brilliantly in all of this. He says, I was walking your town and I saw a statue to the unknown God. I see you worshiping a God that you do not know. Well, I'm here today to tell you about that God. So immediately the ears are like, hey, what, do you, what does he have to say? And he says, the one you worship without knowing. So you worship him in ignorance. How many people do that today? The things they do, the things they worship in their lives, they do in ignorance. And so this idol, this unknown God's idol, its very existence was really admitting that they are ignorant, that they didn't know, that they were like agnostics. You know, Jesus said in John 4, 23, the hour is coming. And now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. And so Paul now uses this idol as a door to proclaim the true God to them. And I think it bugged Paul. Because the moment that you make a God with your hands, 
<laughs> it's less than you. You can't make something greater than you. Then you are the creator of this God. And we know the reality is that you will eventually become like what you worship. You will eventually become like your God. So if your God now is a creation of your own hands, of your own mind to justify your immoral lifestyle, then you will become more and more immoral. You'll become more and more corrupt. You'll eventually become a slave to the very false God that you created yourself. That's breaking the second commandment. God said, don't make a God to suit yourself. There was a warning for us. Look at verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So as Paul starts now to witness, he starts with God, the true God that they do not know. You know, he doesn't pull any punches because with this one statement he makes here, he blows both of these philosophies out of the water in one moment. He's saying to them, God is not a creation of man. He is the creator of man. He created everything, but he is distinct and separate from his creation. And I think this is number eight. When we're evangelizing, we often have to correct people's understanding of who God is, their idea about God. Because people's ideas about God come from a long time of being without God, come from people in the world. They don't have a true idea of who God is. He says, God, who is the Lord of heaven and earth. It means he is above all and he doesn't dwell in temples made with man's hands. You know, even as Solomon himself said, behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. We could put God in a little box, you know, in a little temple. So the true God is not worshipped through idols and through images because it's a much deeper and a much more personal thing than that. Look at verse 25. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath and all things. You know, Paul uses perfect logic here. He says, if God made you, why would he then need anything from you? If you could make something like you. He gives life and breath and all things to all things. God is the provider. God doesn't need anyone. He gives everything to everyone. You know what? And that's the difference between religion and philosophy on the one hand and relationship with the true God on the other hand. Because religion and philosophy focus on what we do, what we give. Where relationship with Jesus Christ focuses on what God has done on our behalf to give us what God wants to give us. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Listen to this. He has made from one blood every nation. So much for racism, you know. According to the Bible, there's only one race. Because the Greeks, like the Jews, they believed that they were a special race. Different from all kinds of other people, you know. The same thing we see all over the world today still. But the biblical truth is, we are all descendants from Adam through Noah. There's one God who created us all. We all have the same blood in our veins. And he says God has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries. God is also the one who sets the limits for men. You know, in all things we do. Romans 1 verse 20, Paul says, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's no excuses for someone to say, I didn't know there was a true God. Look at verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. So Paul says that's the reason why there's a longing for you in your heart to know God. That's why you even made a statue to the unknown God, because God is the one who put that very desire in your heart, in the hope that you may find him, grope for him. You know what? God wants you to find him. He's not far from any one of us, is what Paul is saying right here. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
We depend on God for everything. And it's interesting that he says two of your poets, like your poets have said the same thing. He quotes now from two of their poets to support what he's saying. It's like, I know what you guys are saying. He doesn't say, it's not like they knew God, but the, the truth that they were speaking reflected a biblical truth. The one guy was Epimenides, who came from Crete in 600 BC. The other one was Aratus in 310 BC. But Paul makes a logical conclusion here. He says, God made us in his image. So it's foolish for us to try and make gods in our image. Isn't that weird? Look at verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. He's saying to them, God is divine. And since we are his offspring, since we are from the hand of God, we should not think that God can be represented by any earthly things, even the shiny things on earth like gold and silver. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He says, I know you didn't know, you were ignorant, but now I've told you the truth and now you are responsible for this. He says, now you have to repent. God's been gracious for a long time, but now it's time to repent. And repentance obviously means to change your mind, to change your direction. Like I was going the way of the world, now I see the truth and now I turn around and I go God's way. That's what repentance means. And I think this is important when we're evangelizing number nine. We need to preach repentance. You know, repentance has been called the first word of the gospel. You think about Jesus when he started his ministry. The first thing he says, he went out preaching repentance. People need to repent. John the Baptist, you went on the scene. First thing he says, repent. You know, we think about Peter. And you know, all, the, all the guys who start preaching, they start preaching repentance. No one has any excuses to be ignorant of the true God. Because God has clearly revealed himself to man. Even as Paul says in Romans chapter 1. God is knowable. Atheists and agnostics, they just reject God's revelation of himself. You know, they want it on their own terms and they can't have it like that people are so stubborn they are so small-minded even so-called brilliant people in this world people will say stuff like you know if there's truly a god you know then let him strike me down right now here i am standing defying him and all i'm thinking is dude god doesn't want to strike you down god wants to save you why would he strike you down then you are lost forever god loves you I think it's such a great mistake of people in the world, such a great wrong in their thinking, because they think because God's not judging me for all the things I'm doing, because I'm not being chastened, because I'm getting away with it, you know, God must be fine with it. But they forget one very big thing. They miss the big picture. They miss the love and the long suffering of God. God wants you to be saved. God has given his son to prove how much he wants you to be saved. God has paid the price, made the way. You just have to believe in the work of Jesus on the cross. God loves us so much, but people are so stubborn. And there's going to be a time where his long suffering finally runs out. You know, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of which, which I'm chief. Paul says that's why Jesus came. He wants to save you. Jesus himself said in John 3, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, Jesus has done all of it. We just need to repent and turn to him. Look at verse 31. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So there is a day of judgment coming where the righteous judge is going to judge. He says, the man by whom he was ordained, Jesus Christ, and he's going to judge in righteousness, not by any other standard, not by some worldly standard, but by God's perfect standard. Not only is God a holy God, he's a true and a righteous God, and he's going to judge by his standard. I think that's the last Number 10, we want to look at when we are evangelizing, we want to warn people of the judgment to come. And you say, well, I don't do that. That's getting a little heavy, you know. 
Because think about this is what the enemy blinds people to. He doesn't want them to see the edge of the cliff, the waterfall that's coming. He's like, he just wants them to be blind and happy until that moment where there's no turning back, when there's no way to escape the judgment. Paul is boldly preaching the truth of the judgment right here. He's saying to them, you got to wake up and realize that you're not just going to become part of nature again when you die. You're not just going to cease to exist. Or in the context of many things today, you're not just going to, you know, get another shot at life or some reincarnation cycle or whatever you may believe. You see, what you may believe, you may be so sincere in what you believe, but that will not change the truth of God. There is an end coming. There is a judgment day coming, and we need to warn people about that. And then Paul says, he's given us assurance by raising him from the dead. He says, Jesus, the one I'm preaching to you, his resurrection is the proof of all of what I'm saying is true. Look at verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. The resurrection, you see, Paul focuses on the resurrection because this is the hope in our Christian life. And what did they do? Some mocked, others said, we'll hear him again. This is the point where his sermon gets interrupted right here. Some people say, hey, you crazy man. And others say, ah, oh, we'll come again next time. But guess what? Next time never comes. These are the two typical reactions to when we share the gospel. The one is mocking. People make fun of what you say. The other one is apathy. Like, I'll consider it later. I'll think about that some other time. You know what? And that's one of the greatest lies of the enemy. Because there may not be another time to consider it. And then it's too late. They disregarded God's word. And Jesus said in Matthew 13, 12, He says, Whoever has to him, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That's like the seed. It's like the word of God that fell on the wayside, that fell on the stony ground, that fell among the thorns, the cares of this life, and it just disappears. Even that little bit that was there is just now gone. But ask yourself, why do these people interrupt Paul at this point when he starts preaching the resurrection? It's not just because they don't believe in a resurrection, but it's because they do not want to believe, let me tell you. Because believing might bring a change to their lifestyle. It may bring a change to their plans. It may bring the end to their sin, the sin that they love so much, the sin that they enjoy. And this is such a crazy thing. Here's a city full of brilliant thinking people, full of ideas and philosophies, but they don't get the truth of God. And Paul comes not with some kind of attractive sayings and speeches to win friends and influence people. He came with the truth of the word of God. He came with the gospel. The most powerful force to transform any person's life. There's nothing like what Jesus can do in your life. No counseling or help of man can do anything for you, but God can take you from absolute darkness to absolute light. Look at verse 33. So Paul departed from among them. You know, he wasn't interested in discussing philosophies. This was a, a work of the Holy Spirit that needed to be done in their hearts. He said what he needed to say by the power of the Spirit. But as he now left, one good thing is that truth that he left them with. He left them with a personal decision. Like, listen, you've got to make a decision about this Jesus. You've got to make a decision. You know, and of course, some then chose Jesus. Look at the last verse. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Demaris, and others with them. We should be encouraged by those people who do respond to the gospel when we evangelize. Because God is always at work. We can't do anything for the people who kick against the truth. We see this one guy here, Dionysius the Areopagite. You know, he was named after this rock. It's like he was there all the time probably. So the guy, the guy who's always there, he's heard it all. And now the truth of God has set him free. He turned to Jesus. Because we need to be above all things as we evangelize. We need to be led by the Spirit of God. We not need to trust in the work that the Word of God can do in a person's heart and their life. You see, only God can work in someone's heart. And so we need to evangelize by the Spirit. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for a, 
a wonderful study in your word. It was such an encouragement to see how you use Paul's life to bring many people to salvation. And Father, we live in a world today that is close to the gospel just like it was in that day. A world that is blinded by Satan with the reasonings and the pleasures and the plans of this life, Lord. And I want to pray, may you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us that burden in our hearts for the lost. May Lord, may you stir us up that while there's still time, we may get to share. May you give us divine opportunities where we may proclaim the gospel to people. And may you save people, Lord. May you save the people in our town. So many religious people, Lord, but so many of them are completely lost in their sins, in their lifestyles. Thank you, Father, that your word has power to save. The gospel is the news about Jesus Christ, the one who gave himself for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you made a way. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us a spirit. May you lead us by the spirit of whatever we do, we will do by your power, Lord, by your plan for your glory. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God really give you a heart for the lost people all around you. May God empower you with His Holy Spirit. And may God bless you as you go into this week.